everything casts a shadow. Indeed, often the brighter and, and, and sharper the light, the darker the shadow that it is cast. And every technology that we have ever, ever come up with has cast a shadow. How's it going, everybody? My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture from the individual to society at large. This week, I am extremely excited and humbled to have on the show one of my favorite thinkers and creatives, the myth and the legend himself, Stephen Fry. For those of you who may not be familiar with Stephen Fry, he is an actor, a comedian, writer, and director who starred in numerous films, produced documentaries. He's done the audiobooks for all of the Harry Potters. He's created podcasts about technology, and he's constantly fought for reason, empiricism, kindness, and humanism throughout his entire life. His list of accomplishments is so vast that it would take far too long to cover here, so I'll simply let you look at his Wikipedia and get a sense of how prolific Stephen truly is. And instead, we'll just go ahead and dig in, and I'll let you know a little bit about what we talked about on this episode. Specifically, we start by exploring the lessons that myths can teach us, especially as it relates to technology. And this was in honor of Stephen's latest book release, Troy, which follows his other works, Mythos and Heroes, a series of compendiums where Stephen retells the myths of ancient Greece, sprucing up the storytelling with his trademark proclivity towards wit and wisdom. From there, we move on to explore the rise of artificial intelligence and the upcoming technological transformation of humanity, with an emphasis on exploring the role that culture plays in steering this future. Now, before we get into it, there are a few things I want to quickly let you know about that are happening within the Singularity universe. First, let's jump to a short message about our premium membership experience, where you can learn how to unlock a special offer for two weeks of free access. Singularity's premium membership is your chance to be part of an exclusive, private community of like-minded leaders and changemakers who are committed to professional growth and impact. You'll have access to a constant stream of webinars, roundtables, and professional networking events focused on exploring the key concepts and trends of exponential technology, where you'll be joined by both your peers and by a panel of academics and experts. You will also receive research and insights created and curated by our global experts, which are designed to help members gather, develop, and inform action on a variety of topics and issues related to exponential technology and impact. For a limited time, we're giving podcast listeners a free two-week trial membership of this premium experience simply by going to singularity.org slash two-week trial. That's singularity.org slash two, as in the number two, week trial, where you can click try free to begin. You'll also find this link in the show notes of the podcast. And so there you have it, everybody. Two free weeks of premium membership ready for the taking if you find your curiosity peaked. If you've been wanting a chance to get a look inside Singularity, this is going to be one of the best ways to do it. Additionally, we do have some very exciting news. After taking 2020 off due to the pandemic, we are happy to announce that Singularity's executive program is returning. So for those of you who are ready to take your next transformative leap into becoming a leader of the future... You can join us between November 7th and 11th, where we'll help you challenge your ideas of what is possible. This is your chance to develop a new understanding about the role technology will play in the world of tomorrow, and you'll leave the event feeling inspired by a radically new mindset and skill set that will help you start companies, change companies, and really make an impact on the world. You can learn more and apply by visiting su.org slash EP2021. So check the show notes if you're interested in either the premium membership or the executive program, and all the links you need will be there. But for now, let's get to the real reason you are here. Everybody, it is time to welcome to the podcast the ever-endearing and inspirational Stephen Fry. Um, To start, that's one of the things I would love to focus on is why do you find these Greek myths so appealing and 
Why retell these ancient stories? As always, I think, with a lot of human instincts and impulses, you have to try and rationalise after the fact, because there's no question I am very drawn to these stories and always have been since I was a child. I, I just found them so full of character and juice and a kind of truth. Of course, I never believed for a minute that uh, Hermes and Athena and Zeus walked the earth or indeed sat in stone thrones on Mount Olympus. But there was a truth to it that I instinctively apprehended, I think, and a lot of people do, a lot of people, especially as they're in their sort of mid to late childhood adolescence, they find something very rewarding and appealing about these characters. You, you somehow join into a great stream of human thinking. But since that time, of course, uh, after writing these three books and currently engaged in the fourth, which is the Odyssey, um, I have naturally had cause to wonder what it is about them that is so appealing, what draws me to them. And there are different ways you can rationalise or even intellectualise in quite fanciful manners. Um, what's so fascinating about myth is that it is an expression of what Jung called the collective unconscious. Um, in a sense, you can look at it as a sort of, it's part of the human urge to use ritual and ceremony as kind of metaphors, or almost a sort of performative algebra through which we can work out our our feelings and our thoughts. And as always, I'm, I'm, I'm an empiricist and I hate talking in abstract terms, and general terms. So I try and come down to an example. And for me, a thing that hit me over the head and which is very appropriate for you and singularity and uh, any thoughts that we might have about futurology and so on, uh, a thing that really struck me, and I'll just retell the story slightly so that those who are not familiar will get a sense of it, is Prometheus, the Titan. Uh, his name means forethought, as it happens, but I, I would urge everyone not to regard Greek myths as allegories in which there's a simple uh, substitution for everything that kind of tells the story, that, but they have allegorical areas. Anyway, Prometheus was a Titan, one of the earliest uh, forms of immortal being. And he was a great friend of Zeus, the king of the gods, who ran Olympus. And between them, they had this idea of creating a new species on Earth. There were animals and there were the semi-divine and divine figures, the nymphs and the dryads and the various spirits of uh, and fauns and things like that, spirits of the trees and woods, and of course, the gods themselves and these great powers. Uh, but they decided they wanted to create another species, a species that had the same sort of intelligence as the gods, probably language, but not the divine spark of the gods. Zeus was very clear about that. They could be a sort of plaything for the gods, a toy, a uh, little automata, little, uh, little godlike creatures, um, as long as they knew their place and they could serve and they could worship and, and uh, sacrifice to the gods. And Prometheus was made to agree that they could have everything except fire. And fire you can take to mean both the fire that roasts and toasts and melts and smelts, the fire that causes technology to, to give us ceramics and, um, and, and metalwork and all the remarkable things that fire can do to protect these creatures, because Prometheus made them and they were called anthropoi from the ground, from the earth, man, uh, uh, as, as we would call them, or humankind. Um, but they didn't have any weapons like most animals do. They couldn't fly or swim particularly well. They didn't have horns or echolocation or any special tricks that almost all animals have. They didn't really have claws and teeth that were as good as most predators. And they didn't have the strength that uh, the prey animals have. Uh, and uh, the Prometheus worried about this because he loved these little creatures. They were like gods, a bit smaller, forked animals, you know, with two legs and two, two arms arms and upright like the gods um, and he couldn't resist it he he went to Olympus and he stole fire from heaven uh, against Zeus's orders and gave it to mankind now that fire as I say is both literal fire but it's also the divine fire the spark of self-consciousness that so distinguishes humanity from other life forms so that's our special gift as we know this is our divine fire 
Anyway, Zeus was so angry that man had been given fire because he looked down from heaven and saw all these little flames bursting out and realized, most importantly, that it meant man would no longer need the gods. We could literally stand on our own two feet, but we could also protect ourselves with fire and we could use this awareness, this consciousness, this godlike ability to feel that we could name the universe and the parts of the world into which we were born and, and own it, colonize it uh, in a very different way to the way that animals do. This Zeus knew would mean they, we would no longer need gods. And sure enough, in time, we gave up on the gods. We relegated them to paintings and stories and uh, amusing ideas and dramas. And Brad Pitt played, um, you know, Achilles and so on. And um, all right, that's a nice story. It is essentially an origin story, like the Garden of Eden. How did mankind get this strange thing called consciousness? In the Garden of Eden, it's a fruit uh, that gives the, the ability to to discriminate between good and evil and to, to name things that Adam does and, and so on. And, and it's a very different, it's a story of guilt. Uh, and we are ashamed we have committed a sin, original sin. But in the Greek idea, it is that uh, we, were, we were given this and, and God was, the gods were jealous because we could suddenly ape them. We are now at a new Promethean age and never before at least as far as we know, have we been in such an interesting situation, so akin to that of Prometheus and Zeus. There are people who will say it's nearly always 30 years. We know the cliche is about AI winters and how it's always 30 years ahead. But there is, as your podcast title helps us remember, this idea of a singularity, of a moment when some compendium, some mixture of biologically augmented humanity, gene edited with new materials, controlled by quantum computing and with the latest in robotics and AI, will create entities, we'll call them that. Robots is a word that's confusing and pure AI is too kind of, too broad an idea um, stretched across so many different servers and countries and so on, but entities, could certainly be produced without uh, anyone thinking we're fanciful, who reach a phase of intelligence that is enough to suggest that that spark of self-consciousness might arrive, that that moment might arrive. And here in the world, people like you and me who are interested in this development, people like Elon Musk, of course, and others who have their own views about the dangers or the excitements of this coming tsunami of convergent technologies, which will all build towards this moment, this singularity. Um, and some of us are Prometheuses who say, let's give these creatures the ability, these entities, the ability to think for themselves and actually to have a sense of intelligence akin to ours, that to, to, to spark a consciousness like ours, to give that flame. Let's do it. And others like Zeus will say, no, we can't. If we do, they won't need us anymore. They will just regard us as a strange organic mess in the corner to be, to be dispensed with, just as we dispensed with the gods. And of course, maybe the gods themselves were created back in the past by another mm -hmm. uh, race of beings who then, who then were made useless because the gods, did, you know, got their own intelligence and so on and so on. I mean, it's who could have guessed that these um, Mediterranean people who were gathered together around the Bronze Age um, should have come up and before, in fact, should have come up with a, a metaphor, a uh, a, a, a dramatic playing out of ideas about ourself and our consciousness and what separates us from other people, other animals, um, that it should be so, so much the best story to explain to those interested, and I hope that's the whole human population, in, in what direction technology is potentially taking us at the moment. And that, that drama, that dialectic between Zeus and Prometheus, which is the basis of the Shelley poem, uh, is 
still with us. What I'm curious about is where you fall on that. Do you think the the Greek myths have guided you to fall towards the Promethean side, the Zeus side, or are you staying in the middle, perpetually agnostic? It's a really good question, Stephen. And I think anybody who's who's tried to look into this this, this question of uh, of artificial intelligence for any length of time is, if they're honest, is likely to swing one way or another. Part of us out of sheer intellectual curiosity and excitement belongs to the Prometheus camp that wants to see what can be done, um, that whether we can, you know, shout like um, Victor Frankenstein and, you know, as Boris Karloff, it's alive, you know, it, 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 it's, it's that feeling, that amazing feeling that we could be midwife to a whole generation of extraordinary intelligent creatures who become more and more intelligent at each iteration, each pass, of course. That they, um, and then another part of me, of course, is very, very frightened, is, is at least there's the possibility of absolute destruction on the, at, the, at the hands of these creatures, which I think, I hope and believe we're sensible enough to be able to forestall in, in various ways. We can set ourselves important, clever, puzzles and you know people like you and and, and others and uh, you know, right up to the great Ray Kurzweil himself or the, you know are very good at, at writing quite simple apparently simple rules a bit like the Asimov rules of robotics you know which are quite simple but but very important as establishing protocols but as I say whether whether the whole world will obey them and that's the thing we imagine some mad East European or whatever, whatever our racist propensity that drives us to, to believing is the most dangerous part of the world. Some evil genius could easily be in London, let's be honest, um, uh, uh, who, who just doesn't, who doesn't obey the rules uh, and who is just too excited to see. So I don't know is the answer, but I, I mean, I can remember uh, when I first was interested in AI, which was back in the days of the great Marvin Minsky, who's often regarded as uh, the cliche coming the father of AI. But uh, he, he wrote such marvelous things about his first moves and his colleagues' moves towards thinking about an AI um, that I almost regarded the whole business as a kind of bit like Plato, it, it, you never ever get there because in the 60s and 70s, it really did seem miles and miles away. But it teaches you so much about our own intelligence. Looking at artificial intelligence is a wonderful way of looking at ours because it makes us break down, literally analyze in every way uh, what it is that makes us intelligent and indeed how many rooms there are in the mansion of human cognition and memory. There's so many, you know, to say there's one memory is like saying, you know, most people who speak English are familiar with the idea that it's a, a failure in the language that we only have one word for love, which, you know, covers so many different forms of it. And many other languages like Greek, for example, have five or six. And similarly with intelligence or with memory, to have one word for memory, the, the part of your brain that recalls the first ice cream you ever ate is surely not the same part of the brain that recalls that the Battle of Bannockburn was in the year 1314 or whatever, you know, and, and, uh, and then many other forms of memory too, and f forms of in intelligence, cognition, uh, calculatory abilities and so on. All these you have to look at when trying to plan how you might have such a thing as an artificially intelligent being. You said before yeah. that, I, I love a quote that you said before that I think is really re relevant. It was something to the effect of, we need to understand who humans are before we can grapple with the nature of what machines may or may not be. And I just wonder, what's that relationship like to you in terms of specifically the need to understand the arts and humanities before we create machines? I think it, it's very interesting. I think the arts and humanities like myth um, and obviously like science too are, are different ways of trying to penetrate the mystery of, of who we are and uh, what, what is it that 
makes us this bundle of different abilities and competencies and deficits and failures uh, and appetites and, and, and so on. There are so many of them contradictory. And it is a kind of supreme irony that is rather typical of our race, our species, that at just this moment that we are closest to really being able to create an artificial intelligence of some kind, a general intelligence at least, um, we are also, through the work of um, quite brilliant neuroscientists and economists and philosophers like Daniel Kahneman, for example, discovering the absolute contingency and vulnerability of everything we think that actually we realize our intelligence is a very, very feeble and frail network of things that are totally unreliable, that, that the uh, optical illusions that fill gaps that make us amused when we look at them are actually just tiny versions of the even vaster illusion, which is our apprehension of the world, both th empirically through our senses and rationally through our reasoning, we seem to erect something utterly fake, but utterly convincing, a lattice of a matrix, as in the movie, if you like, you know, that it, it, it's, uh, it's something that philosophers have always been aware of, this, this idea um, of, of the contingency and the, the, you know, the unreliability of our senses and our reason. Um, and and we, yet we have no other window on, on re, either reality or metaphysics, either the, the real world as we perceive it or, or the, the laws that stitch it together, the metaphysical laws, if you like. We can only approach them with, with our eyes and senses, our empirical senses, or with reason. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how the interplay between culture, language, and technology is unfolding. Are these cultural narratives, are our public dreams, our myths currently creating a technology that is maybe undermining the best of our human potential? Or is the technology, do you feel the technology is potentially driving us towards creating culture that is undermining? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I think that, that there is an obvious reciprocity between technology and the arts and language and cultural considerations. Um, and I can't remember who it was who pointed out that it's a, it's, a, it's a very good way of looking at this, is that the very language we use to describe, for example, the mind uh, is really dependent on our technology or what is around us. So when St. Augustine was writing about the mind, he wrote about canyons and ravines and peaks because he looked out of his window or his cell and he saw little more than, I say little more, it's enough. He saw nature, he saw canyons and ravines and mountains and streams. And so his metaphors were always that of, um, of consciousness as a river or um, and of mountains to be scaled and peaks and so on. And then a little later on in, in the um, sort of 19th century and so on, as the machine age took off, the mind and the, it, it was seen as a machine, as, as something rolling cogs, literally the cogs are turning in the, in the mind, because suddenly that was a metaphor we could take from technology and apply it inwards. Um, and, and then, of course, it became like a motor car. The engine, the mind won't start. It won't, you know. um, and in the period, another period of the 19th century, uh, uh, one that I think a lot of people didn't understand the traumatic nature enough of, which was geology, because it's what um, I think Ruskin, the, the art critic, called it those damned hammers. Those, the hammers of the geologists hammered away at everything that was believed about the age of the earth and about the primacy of man. It was a huge moment. It was sort of bigger really than, than Darwin, but we remember Darwin as being the thing that upset everything, but it was really because the geology proved Darwin apart from the else, incontrovertibly showed that the one flaw in Darwin that Kelvin and other scientists had seen was that there would have to be so much time to allow for his biological algorithms to play out 
Um, and as if by magic, geologists suddenly discovered that, oh, look, there was enough time and these fossils appeared and other such things. And so those damned hammers. And, and similarly, as we started to talk about the mind, we started to talk about layers and accretions, and sedimentary layers of memory that were down there to be drilled down into. And that's what the first alienists and psychologists and psychiatrists did. Um, and then, of course, obviously, you started to get computing, and that's where we're sort of stuck now. The mind is a computer. It computes. It has a central processing system. It sends out messages electrically to other bits, has a stack, and it has registers, and it does all those things. It has kind of programming in it, if only we could know. So in that sense, our language and our sense of self is dependent on the technology that we offer. And so our culture has always been a, a magnificent way of showing a profound confidence in our place in the world. And it is a colonizing uh, uh, influence. And in some ways it's parallel to the disastrous colonizing influence that we've had in terms of the, our influence on the biosphere in, in climate and pollution and plastics and all the other horrible things we've done by colonizing the earth, by feeling that we are the gods of it. We have really screwed it up as we know um, but in terms of, of culture, we have created this series of stories and narratives, explanations of who we are and how we think and where we come from. And they can fit almost any genre. You can tell the, ta the same story in, in almost any way. You can tell it in a mythic way. You can tell it in a movie. You can tell it in a poem. You can tell it in a painting. You can suggest the same thing. But inside, we are, I think, just as... I don't think you could ever meet a surgeon or a doctor who said, I, I cut this person open and discovered they had three hearts, or this person didn't have any kidneys. The fact is, if we are standing up and, you know, not totally in some terrible physical or, or cognitive deficit, we have two kidneys, we have one liver, we have two lungs, we, you know, we are all the same. It doesn't matter whether we're Jeff Bezos or whether we're, a, we're, we're a, a, a subsistence farmer in Madagascar. We are identical in that physical sense. And actually, in terms of our feelings and our beliefs and our hopes and our desires and our failures and our, our you know, our, our needs, we are just as identical. Uh, no, you know, it, it's, it's that the one thing that culture and myth should teach us, and we need this lesson now more than ever, is that point that an alien looking at the earth for the first time would really see very little difference between us, between our languages, but, you know, even though they seem so different, what they'd say, oh, right, they all speak in exactly the same way, but slightly different sounds. Uh, they all stand the same way. They all eat, feed the same way. They all hurt each other sometimes. They all do, you know, there is just mm -hmm. no difference between us. It's, it's absurd that most, almost all the trouble in the world is based on this idea the, of differences between us. And yeah. actually they are functionally almost down to a nullity, a zero. And that's something you've talked a lot about. And I, I would say, for most of your life really is the way culture is potentially becoming corruptive. Um, you've said before that the enlightenment values are being deliberately and systematically pushed back. You've talked a lot about religion, about political correctness, and a lot of these ideas. <clears throat> do you think that do you think that we can create a, a new myth to maybe help unify us? Do you think there are ideas that we can put forth to maybe help right, right the ship as we navigate this transformation into a potentially Promethean, uh, artificially intelligent future? <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting idea, isn't it? Because the, the, the last thing we want to do is to, is to break through the, the membrane separating us, the now from, this, from the general intelligence singularity at a time when we are most opposed to each other, when there are new cold wars and new walls of misunderstanding between cultures. It would be a disastrous time in particular. It would be lovely to think we were unified. 
uh, historically, when has mankind ever been unified? Well, we don't know because we've never been mankind in a global sort of McLuhan sense of the global village, all, you know, all aware of each other before. Uh, so you can talk about times when individual cultures have unified, and that's always, almost always, I think, because there's been a threat, uh, an, an outside threat, either in the form of an invade, invading people uh, or a, a disease or a famine. Uh, it's the, the, the horsemen of the apocalypse, essentially, are what unite people. And so when I remember saying a couple of years ago, huh, I said something along the lines of, the only thing that will heal up the rift within our culture, that I'm speaking to you as, as a member of the same sort of what used to be called Western culture, or whatever we like to call it, we know there's a huge rift in America and Britain and all, all over Europe and that part, um, as well as the various rifts we may have with China and Russia and so on. Um, and I remember saying the only thing that will heal it up would be if there were a, a threat, may, maybe from outer space. And then we would all come together to protect the planet. And then I thought, well, actually, hang on. There is a threat to the planet. It's never been greater. And that's the threat of climate change and pollution and destruction and species depredation and uh, all as ocean acidification and sea rise level and all those things. That's a threat. And that hasn't united us. It's actually done more to throw us apart. And then came COVID. Mm -hmm. So, well, there's a threat that can unite us. Has that united us? Hell no. Um, I mean, it hasn't hasn't caused a war, thank goodness. It could have been a more disastrous response, but yeah. the poor old World Health Authority, the World Health Organization has hardly had a central unifying role. It's done its best. But, uh, you know, so the fact is um, we do seem to be doomed not to be united. And I, of course, come from a place where a mixture of fantasy and misremembering, which is common to all humans. So I have my view of, there was a time when we had a, we all drank from the same trough. We, we were the, you know, we had a similar outlook, similar beliefs, similar hopes. We weren't divided by these hatreds. Just as, you know, the great make America great again, people have a misremembered view that there was an America that was just this perfect place of happiness and prosperity and cookies and, and, and milk. And, and it was all lovely, the, the little 50s buzz cuts and I like Ike and, you know, this, <laughs> this fantasy of the 50s America, which was the time of the you know, the witch trials and the most appalling, <laughs> appalling uh, Jim Crowism and goodness knows what else. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're all as guilty of thinking that there was a golden age. And that's, again, something that myth can tell us, because from the very beginning, uh, the Greek and many other mythological cycles have had this idea of a previous golden age, uh, uh, an Arcadia in, in which, you know, uh, the, you, we were, we, uh, mankind was youth just as we think of our youth as being full of opportunity and sexiness and surprise and fitness and bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, glossy-haired loveliness, that was, I was young and I skipped about and I was appetizing and always beautiful. And now look at me, I'm, my <laughs> nipples are descending by two inches every year. And, oh, I'm a mess. And similarly, we look at the world like that. The world was young. It was a golden age. We were skipping. Nonsense. Um, of course it's nonsense. And anybody who reads history and literature knows it's nonsense and that we've always written about the corruptive uh, uh, forces of the contemporary culture. They, they wrote about it in the 18th century, they wrote about it in Shakespeare's day, I mean the famous John of Gaunt speech in Richard II, much of Hamlet and all kinds of other parts of Shakespeare are full of people talking about the Oh, the new age is, is, is a corrupt age, and that there was a golden age, if, you know, a Falstaffian age in the case of Shakespeare. And, and, and then again, you go back to the classics and the same thing, to the dawn of the historical age, i.e. the age of writing. Uh, people have talked about this idea. So the, what is, of course, the best hope, therefore, to, to, unite, to unite us in, in, in some way? in some way to unite us. Uh, and there are counterintuitive proposals that you, you sort of detect around. 
uh, a counterintuitive one is, of course, that what unites us is our ability to accept our differences. And that's a, 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 a view that I think I share and, and that has become pretty mainstream now, is that it's not homogeneity that, that will force us all to be um, accepting and united and harmonious. Um, it is, as the name harmony suggests musically, by combining the different elements uh, acceptingly and sweetly and gracefully that we find that harmony, not by, you know, it's not um, to, to keep it musical. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not by doing it in a, um, what's the musical term, tutti, you know, uh, where, where it's, it's non-harmonized, non where everybody's singing the same notes, it's where everybody's singing different notes that you get harmony. So that's a cute little thing that could make a hippie folk song and it doesn't solve the problems of the world. <laughs> but it, it suggests that uh, that is one way of doing it because the only other way that has ever really worked has been um, what you might call a benign dictatorship. Uh, and those are very, very rare. Um, and they they don't last very long. In other words, a strong leader um, where, where people, as I say, unite in a common cause under a strong leader. And we, we know the dark side of that is dictators and tyrants. Um, um, and uh, so where would you look in the history of any nation to give inspiration? Um, and that's really the problem, isn't it? Because... Um, those of us who are fascinated by science, technology, the progress of the intellectual quest uh, uh, of the Enlightenment, uh, obviously believe that if there is to be a solution, it will be found by us using all our senses, by our intelligence, our reason, our empirical skills and our scientific endeavors, our philosophical, ethical questing, all of that will have to be engaged. Whereas there are those uh, on the mystical side of things, some of whom are very well trained in philosophy and are by no means just dopey idiots of the, um, you know, of the Deepak Chopra variety, um, but, you know, the Alan Watts variety more likely or other types of uh, slightly quasi-Buddhist, quasi-stoical uh, philosophical views, but which are about taking yourself out of society and are about uh, repudiating, turning your back on the, the, the energies that make Western science and philosophical inquiry so powerful that those energies can be seen to have torn us apart. They are because they, you know, they... They do what we do to the earth. They they quarry, they tear, they rip, they rape the earth, and and what's left are dead zones and slag heaps, and 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 in terms of economics, underclasses, and and those who are not served by the onwards sweep of progress. There's a huge residue of unhappiness and misery. Therefore, the answer is to turn our back on science. Now, is there a middle course? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, I'd love I that. Support... Go ahead. No, I see you were about to ask a question. I, I wondered what, if that was about well, what it was comes just, in between. <laughs> yeah, it was just making me think, you know, my <clears throat> I'm actually working on a personal podcast called Society in Question, and it's all about kind of navigating that very thing you're talking about. So as you're talking about yeah. that. Yeah, because it is so interesting. If You're much younger than me, but I, I do think if I were, I don't know, uh, uh, an old teenager, a young 20-year-old, um, I... I would genuinely think about the possibility of, um, with friends, devising a sort of new communitarian philosophy with, you know, it, it turned very sour in the late 60s when the hippie movement became the drug movement and the Manson family and various other images kind of arose out of the and it just looked like a squalid mess and those communities looked like pigsties and suddenly it made one feel very bourgeois and, 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 and wanting nothing to do with it but that that's a shame it doesn't mean one has to throw away all the ideas and idealism uh, um, because it, Again, it was a repeat. It had happened in the late 19th century with the arts and crafts movement of William Morris and various others, various utopian views of, of, of 
of finding a, a more medieval craft oriented and and people have tried to do that i mean the language is always such a giveaway if you look at the language of the past 10 years that emerged from silicon valley everything is now handcrafted in batches by artisans when in fact of course it's the product of endless economic meetings with the financial whiz kids and modelers and uh, it's pure business but but it's 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 like pure business but put in a, a wrapping that's got bits of straw and pig manure in it just to make it look kind of really <laughs> earthy and and, and so, so anyway yes sorry okay. no i just I, I love that idea that you were saying about having a community because that's one of the if there was a myth or a idea that i think is very important right now it's this idea of having a third space you know getting away from the binary yeah. dualistic um us first them mentality and having really a, a third place where you don't have to be left or right but you can be a free thinker in the middle and as long as you're kind yeah. and respectful you're welcome and that that way you always have community and you don't feel the peer pressure of being forced to one of yeah. the extremes and and you won't be quoted uh, for for some for some misbegotten tweet that would come back to bite you in the ass when you know you feel literally able to think freely and openly because you know I be careful what you wish for and those whom the gods wish to punish the first to answer their prayers and all the rest of it I think that's very true and uh, or at least. It, contains elements of great truth. And I wished for this internet revolution. I mean, I I was on CompuServe and uh, Phantom, all kinds of online, uh, commercial online services, and then uh, AOL, and then I got my first dial-up account and in the 90s, before there was a, uh, you know, um, a, a World Wide Web or anything. And and, uh, and I, I, I was so excited. And here's another Greek myth. Um, uh, Pandora, she is part of Zeus's punishment to mankind for daring to have the intelligence that Prometheus gave us through stealing fire. Uh, he prepared a trap for mankind because it was literally mankind. It was only men. He created the first woman, so it's like an Eve myth. Only the he he gave all the other gods instructions to give this woman all their attributes and skills. Um, so Athena gave her handcraft and wisdom and uh, Apollo gave her grace and pr prophecy and music and so on. And uh, so she was all gifted. And the Greek for all gifted is Pandora. So she was called Pandora. And she was sent down with this jar, which through a translation accident in medieval uh, England was turned into a box. But so it's become Pandora's box, but it was actually a pithos, a jar, not a pixos, a both. Uh, it was just a mistake on the part of Erasmus, of all people, who mistranslated it. But that's a side issue, and I'm so sorry to go off on it because I've almost lost my thread, but I haven't. So she's taken down to Earth and she marries Prometheus' his brother, Epimetheus, in fact, uh, whose name means afterthought <laughs> as opposed to Prometheus meaning forethought. And uh, they have a happy, and they have children, but she, she's been told by Zeus she must never open this jar. And of course, she does. And out come these traps, these terrible creatures, these flying, fizzing things with shrieking, howling, leathery wings. And, and they are lies and murder and misrepresentation and cruelty and abuse and uh, war and, and all the terrible things. So a little bit like, as I say, the eating the apple, it's this moment. Again, unfortunately, a myth created by a woman rather than a man who, 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 who does it. And out come all these, all these horrible things. So she slams the lid back on the jar, not knowing that there was one little fairy left in there beating its wings forever against the inside of the jar. And that was Elpis, which is the Greek for hope. So hope was left inside the jar which Nietzsche and various other philosophers said was a very good thing because hope is the most appalling and terrible curse that can ever befall a human being because in a hopeless, meaningless universe, hope is just an absolute cruel trick. <laughs> anyway, so but that's that was the myth. And so to mankind came, having been a golden age, she opened the, the jar and out came all those. So there I am in the 90s thinking, the internet is Pandora. It is all gifted. 
There's music and concerts when I want them. There are films, there are libraries, there are museums, there are beautiful, yes, there are, of course, there are slums. There's, you know, pornography shops in that part of town, as it were. And, and there are some pretty nasty people down there. And I wouldn't send my children to that area, but that's true of any great city, any great beautiful organic creation from man. You know, there's bound to be a mixture, but look at what there is, public squares, places to talk, to change. Uh, you know, you can meet people who've got similar interests from all over the world. You can, oh my goodness, it's Pandora, it's perfect. And then at some point, <laughs> one became aware that the lid had come off and out had poured these terrible abusers and uh, hackers and malware writers and trolls and all the beastliness burst out of it. So again, it's part of a, how a myth can tell an eternal story. Obviously, the Greeks weren't thinking of the internet when they told the Pandora story. What they were thinking of, I suppose, was that everything casts a shadow, that there is a, the, indeed, often the brighter and, and, and sharper the light, the darker the shadow that it is cast. And every technology that we have ever, ever come up with has cast a shadow. As, as I say, it just seems we would want people to shore up the shadows, so to speak. You know, as Pandora's box opened and I would say new light yeah. and new shadows come out, it does seem helpful to have people That's... shore up the shadows as we go along. Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. As, as we do move along, um, are there trends, light um, or shadows, that you're excited about, either culturally, socially, or technologically, or maybe concerned with? But as you look forward, is there something that really speaks to your, your heart and your soul? Well, I, I, I have a sort of um, a probabilistic hope, if you like. Uh, you, you know the way... Um, those who are urging everybody to get vaccinated are saying it, it's not because I care about your health. It's because the more people are vaccinated, the less chance the virus will have to multiply but to such a degree that new variants are inevitable. Because, you know, if there are a million instances of a virus, you, virus, you might get one variant in it, which is destructive to the virus and it'll die. Or you might get half a variant, which is it's passed on to the next generation but if you have a billion instances you have obviously a thousand times more and if you have a billion billion etc cetera, etc cetera. we all know that's obvious um and so the more people uh, that are vaccinated the the fewer instances of the virus there are and therefore the less likelihood of a now in a positive way the more podcasts there are the more people talk the more people exchange ideas the more people push on the frontiers of, of neuroscience and computer science and, and, and um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence science and all these other sciences and philosophies. The more people do that, the more chances there are of smart ideas, variants popping up, which might well blend with other variants, which might produce coherent and credible and verifiable ways of looking to our future in a in a manner that will save us, if you like, just by talking. It's a huge amount of hot air, and most variants will stumble and fall, will not be, as a, as a biologist would say, viable into the next generation. But some might just have legs and be able to walk and talk as ideas in new ways, because that's, you know, that's the glory of free speech and, and open scientific inquiry is that at certain times in our history, Florence in the 15th and 16th centuries, and England in the 17th and 18th centuries, perhaps in America and elsewhere now, and, and uh, uh, just so much talking, so much energy, so many people gathering in corridors and exchanging thoughts and so much, you know, swapping of, of insights. And, um, and a lot of it is useless, of course it is. Of course, it's all like this. It's all hot air. But somewhere, someone may be just saying, maybe if we tried, or why don't we, or there's a way they have of doing things in Bhutan, which dot, dot, dot. And, you know, I mean, it, this is all very fluffy and meaningless and unstructured as a, as a, as a, as a piece of optimism. But I do, I do cling to the idea, at least, that what, any golden hope in the future will come from effort and thought and understanding, not from 
luck or from an angel leaning down from heaven with a bar of gold. It, it, it will be through thought and exchanging ideas. So, so we might as well do that as much as possible. Exactly. How are you on time, Stephen? I want to make sure we're not. I'm, I'm not very good, actually. I, I've sort of got to leave the house at half past 12 yeah. um, uh, to zoom off to do a, um, a test, a, a um, uh, um, what's the word? A, a PCR, you know, a COVID test. <laughs> sure. Well, then on that note, let's just go ahead and I want to give you the floor real quick before we wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to just point people towards, you know, the book, uh, any other stuff that well, people can it, it's, uh, take a look at? It, it's obviously a delight talking to you, and I would be thrilled if people were interested. If they wanted to read my my three books so far on Greek myths, on Mythos, Heroes, and Troy. But um, I, I would urge uh, people to interest themselves in this whole field of artificial intelligence and, uh, um, and what the implications of it are and and the story of it. There are there are always ways of of looking at this which aren't too head-spinningly mathematical. Obviously, if you're inclined, there are ways of looking at it which are head-spinningly mathematical, but there are some really good writers. Um, uh, um, uh, Bostrom, for example, the, the Swedish philosopher who works at Oxford and um, Max Thiel and people like that. There are books of general interest, but of great authority, which um, show us the the thrilling ride that we're all in for, whether we like it or not. So, uh, so keep talking, keep listening, and keep being interested in this fantastic subject. Wonderful, Stephen. Again, thank you so much, man. And thank you. Great pleasure. Bye bye. <laughs>